If anybody wishes to say that this is the only planet in the entire universe which has life, then a consequence of that would have to be that the origin of life, the chemical circumstances that gave rise to the first self-replicating molecule, the first proto-gene, the origin of life would have to be a quite fantastically, stupendously rare and improbable event. Because if it were not stupendously rare and improbable, it would be in lots of other planets as well as this one. So if we, if we in theory, imagine a spectrum of possibilities where on the one hand um, uh, there's lots and lots of life all over the universe, on the other hand there's only one. In other words, on this end, the origin of life is a fairly probable chemical event. On that end, it's a colossally improbable, a stupefyingly improbable event. Nevertheless, because there are so many planets, stupefyingly improbable actually means it only happens once in the universe. And with hindsight, this is the so-called anthropic principle, with hindsight, that one planet has got to be this one because we are the ones talking about it. We are the ones sitting here thinking about it. And so the anthropic principle is a very elegant, beautiful idea because it, it has this curious paradoxical effect that it allows us to entertain a, a hugely improbable event and still, and still come up with a satisfying, complete explanation for our own existence. And it's even possible to twist that argument further and say that because we've never actually been visited, as Enrico Fermi said, where are they? <laughs> because we've never been visited, you might deduce from that, or never even been visited by radio waves from a distant planet, you might deduce from that that intelligent life, at least technological life, is indeed very, very rare. And therefore, if it were easy for us to understand the origin of life. If chemists could come up and say, oh yeah, I mean, easy to see how, how, you could, how, how life could, could originate, it could originate in this way or this way or, or this way, we should be positively worried. Because if it's easy to think of how the origin of life happened on this planet, then there should be lots of other planets where it happened as well. So the, one, one corollary of the where are they question is that if there is life elsewhere in the universe, it, it, it's got to be non-technological life. Um, te technological life has got to be rare, which means that either the origin of life itself is very rare, or the origin of life is allowed to be common, but the origin of um, advanced, intelligent, technological life has got to be very rare. Somewhere along the line, you've got to interpose a sort of wall of improbability in order to explain why we have never been visited. Some of the ideas that scientists come up with in trying to explain the origin of the universe, the origin of life, they sound pretty wacky, don't they? And, and it's the sort of thing that, I mean, certainly the origin of the universe, it's hard to conceive of how there would ever be evidence to, to back some of those ideas up. And I know, for instance, in The God Delusion, you refer to the multiverse theory, for instance, and the idea that there are universes within universes and within universes, and that perhaps it might be possible to think of, of a situation where we, we all existed in man, many different universes at the same time. And there's a line in The God Delusion which has been thrown back to you rather scornfully a few times about there are universes in which we are already dead and universes in which we have a green moustache. Yes. And this tends to get thrown well, back at you as if to say, yeah. well, okay, there's on, a, there's you can believe that. There's a little bit of con God. confusion here. Um, there, are, there are two entirely phys physicists, and I'm not one, and there may be plenty of them here, I suspect there are. Um, physicists. Um, use this idea of many universes in two quite different ways. Um, the green moustache way is used by um, <coughs> quantum theorists of a certain kind who, you, you know in, in quantum theory there is extremely weird results. Uh, particles going through two slits at once and Schrodinger's cat uh, you know, either being dead or alive and, and neither until you open the box, that kind of thing. Um, now, there is one school of thought, the many universes school of thought, more, more, not so much school of thought, school of interpretation of what's going on in the quantum weird, weird experiments, which says there are many universes, and in some of the universes, Schrodinger's cat is dead, in other universes, Schrodinger's cat is alive, and in yet other universes, Schrodinger's cat has, shall we say, a green moustache. Um, so th this, is, this is a way of saying, the, um, 
of getting away from the, um, the, the weirdness or explaining and interpreting the weirdness of quantum experiments, which certainly work. And that's, I think, not what, one's, what is meant by a multiverse, mm -hmm. although it sounds superficially similar. The multiverse is the idea that there are lots of different universes with different laws and constants. And physicists do have reasons to postulate that, a reason to postulate the idea that there's a, a sort of foam, as they sometimes put it, of bubbles. And lots and lots of bubbles, and we're just in one bubble. Our entire universe, our entire visible universe, is just one bubble. And there are lots of other bubbles which are different universes with different laws and constants. And one of the uses of the multiverse theory, as opposed to the many worlds quantum theory, one of the uses of the multiverse theory is to account for the fact that not just this planet appears to be friendly to life, but this whole universe appears to be friendly to life. And this has been explored especially by Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal and um, President of the Royal Society, uh, in a book called Just Six Numbers, in which he draws attention to six constants, the fundamental constants of the universe, which physicists at present have no interpretation, no, no understanding of why those numbers have the values that they have. They understand everything else once you've got those six numbers, but they don't understand those six numbers. So those six numbers are simply postulated. They just exist. And um, Martin Rees and others have calculated that if any one of those six numbers was just a bit different, then we wouldn't be here. The universe would hardly be here. It might be that there would be a universe, but everything would be hydrogen and helium. There'd be no other, other elements. Or there'd be no stars. There'd just be a, a, a diffuse mass of, of say, hydrogen. Uh, lots of, uh, the, each one of those six constants, according to Martin Rees, has got to be just so. It, and so one could imagine a theist um, thinking of God with six knobs that he can twiddle, setting up the constants of the universe. And God started out by adjusting each of these six knobs to exactly the right value in order that the universe should last long enough to bring forth life, should have stars instead of just uniform matter, that the, um, that the constant um, governing the, uh, the, the, the strong and the weak forces and so on should, just, should be just right. Well, that's the theistic interpretation, which I think is fatally flawed by the argument I said earlier that complexity can't just happen. The anthropic principle, which is often actually hijacked by religious people, but is in fact a profoundly atheistic argument. The anthropic principle says, there's a multiverse. There's this great foam of bubbles. And in most of these bubbles, the laws and constants of the universe are wrong. They, they're not, they're not, not, not wrong, they're, they're, they're not right for life. They, in, in this bubble here, the universe, only, the universe fizzles out a picosecond after the Big Bang. In this one here, uh, it lasts long enough, but there are no stars. <clears throat> but in this one here, out of the billions of universes in the multiverse, in this one here, the constants are just right. It's the Goldilocks principle, again, but at a cosmic level rather than just a planetary level. Now you can see once again that the anthropic principle allows us with hindsight to say, if there is a multiverse of universes, if there is a foaming bubble of universes, then, and only one of those bubbles, or a few of them, are friendly to life, then by the anthropic principle, we have got to be in that tiny minority of bubbles which is friendly to life. Otherwise, obviously, because we're here. If we were in one of the other bubbles, we wouldn't be, we, we wouldn't be there. Nobody's thinking about this in another bubble. So um, I find that satisfying, so long, of course, as we're allowed to postulate a multiverse. And so it rather turns upon whether physicists have other good reasons to postulate a multiverse, and I think they have. Uh, it, it becomes a little less convincing if the only reason to postulate a multiverse is in order to invoke the anthropic mm. principle. But don't let's get, I mean, what, what, what Paul is referring to is that, is that at the event two days ago, when Christopher Hitchens was having a debate with a man called John Lennox. John Lennox talked about the, the multiverse and talked about green moustaches. Mm -hmm. He was actually confusing the multiverse theory with the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory. As a mathematician, he should know better. Uh, and he was throwing that out as an example of the absurd things religious um, and atheists uh, believe in, um, universes in which people have green moustaches. 
So would I be right in summarising you as thinking that, OK, some of the things that scientists are postulating are pretty weird and sound pretty strange. And superficially, you might say, well, if you can believe that, why can't you believe in a god? But are you saying that what the scientists are putting forward as possible suggestions, not, not claims of truth, but possible suggestions, are at least consistent with, with what science has I think I'd go further than, than that and say that, that history teaches us that, that um, science is weird, <laughs> that, that the that the things that, that modern scientists have discovered, re relativity, quantum theory, they are far more weird than any Grimm or Hans Andersen or, or, or Bible or anybody could possibly imagine. They are just plain weird. 